Well, wishing everyone a very Merry Christmas. I had some of the kids already this morning telling me some of the presents they've got. Some of the parents have been saying that they were woken up very, very, very early. I remember as kids, we'd go to bed at sometimes like one or two in the morning on Christmas Eve because of the midnight service. And, uh, and we'd be up at five or six in the morning trying to check out what presents we had under the tree. Nowadays, I get up before our kids and they love sleeping in. So it's, uh, it's a nice Christmas morning for us just to relax a bit. How many people this year have been watching Christmas movies? There's a few. There's a few good stories on, uh, on some of the movies that come out. But besides being overly decorated and being very predictable, one thing most of them talk about is the spirit of Christmas. The spirit of Christmas is, is a theme in almost every movie that comes out. But unfortunately, most of them miss the mark as to what the spirit of Christmas really is. And I want to look a bit about that today. And uh, my message theme is the light of the world. And we're referring to Jesus, who is the one we celebrate Christmas for. We celebrate because of Jesus Christ. And if you look at the meaning of the Christmas spirit, you look at different articles, you find uh, it's about being joyful, charitable, generous, kind, forgiving. But just saying that's the Christmas spirit is a little bit like me saying, I've got this incredible sword. And then I pull out a scalpel. Now granted, there's some similarities. There's a blade, there's a handle. But if I was to mention sword, you'd probably think of something like Lord of the Rings or some you know, monstrous thing that you can wave around and really do some damage with. And even though there's similarities in the two, they are still very, very different. Because each of them has a different purpose. And if we're going to look at the spirit of Christmas, we have to understand the purpose of the spirit of Christmas. And so for us to do that, we need to look at something a bit deeper. The word Christmas comes from two words, Christ's Mass. And the word Christmas actually was put together as one word in the mid-14th century. Yep. So the, 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 the word Christmas, we're going to look at the origin of this, it's an important part. And so we look at Christ's Mass. It's a celebration of the Eucharist or communion, which is a time we celebrate the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus. So Christmas is actually not just a celebration of Jesus' birth, but his entire life, his death, burial and resurrection, because the whole thing is a package. You can't have a, a death without having a birth. We can't have the resurrection of Jesus without having a death. We can't have the ascension without him actually being resurrected. And so the whole story is much deeper than just a baby being born. It's the day we remember him coming into the world. But Christmas is actually much bigger when we look at it from God's perspective. In addition to that, the word mass also means a dismissal after receiving your orders. So a soldier who stands before his officer and receives his orders, he leaves mass, I guess you'd call it, because he's been dismissed after receiving his orders. So Christmas celebration is actually us remembering the birth, death, uh, the birth, life, death, resurrection and ascension of Jesus, but being dismissed with our orders to go out and share who Jesus actually is. And if we go back to Genesis chapter 3, we see that sin entered the world through Adam and Eve. And it was right back in Genesis that God actually started prophesying his rescue mission for mankind. And all the way through the Old Testament, all the way through the Bible, we see a red thread woven, the story of redemption of Jesus Christ. And William, William Evans says, cut the Bible anywhere and it bleeds. The blood of Jesus stains every page, every book in both testaments. God's atonement is a scarlet cord running through every page of the entire Bible. It's crimson red with redemption and truth. And if we jump to Luke chapter 1, we see uh, Mary actually receiving a, a visitation from the angel. And from verse 26 to 33, it says, In the sixth month, of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. 
She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of the king of David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favoured woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think, Mary tried to think what the angel told her. For you have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High, the Lord God who gave him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. I think it's interesting the angel came and said to Mary, you are to name him Jesus. And most people, when they, they have a, a baby nowadays, they put a lot of time and effort into naming the baby. And I'm not sure if it's changed or not, but when, when Daniel was born, our oldest one, we were told by the nurse we had 60 days to name him. And so they give you lots of time to actually look at names. And many people will name people after, after people, after places, after colours. Uh, I'm named after my grandfather. I used to hate my middle name, Cornelius. Uh, I thought I was named after a rooster on Bugs Bunny or something like that, but <laughs> it turns out my grandfather was pretty cool, so it's an honour to be named after him. But other name examples might be Holland, Nairobi or Belgium. Oceana, cloud, snow, or even after a colour, periwinkle. <laughs> Who would like to name their child periwinkle? <laughs> but we see so many names nowadays, but we go back to this verse, and the angel said, you will name your child Jesus. And in Bible days, names were very important. They indicated a destiny of a person, purpose of life, and they knew that. And so when Mary was told to name her son Jesus, she understood that she was naming her baby Jehovah is salvation. And this was a, a fulfillment of the prophecy that God said that he would send his son into the world. And if we go across to Luke chapter 2, we see the angels coming to, to, to talk to the shepherds. And from verse, I think it's verse 8, it says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. And it's interesting, it starts off, the angels say to the shepherds, do not be afraid. And how many know there's a whole lot of things happening in the world today that cause people to be afraid? You listen to the media and all you hear are stories of fear. I heard one stage several months ago when, when COVID was winding down, one person was diagnosed with COVID in New South Wales and they called it the new epicentre in Australia. The media will give story after story after story that, that portray news and make sales. That's what they're about. But we shouldn't be looking at things that actually generate fear because God is the one who brings hope. He is the one who brings hope and we celebrate him on Christmas Day. So the angels say, do not be afraid. I bring you great news, news of joy that a saviour has been born. And Christmas is a time we celebrate our Saviour being born. In John 8 verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. He is the one our hope is in. He is the one our refuge is in. He is our protection. He is our shelter. He is the one who brings the possibility of peace. And Jesus says to us in Matthew, you are the light of the world. So he's gone from I am the light of the world to you are the light of the world. And this is partly where the Christmas story comes in because we actually have that commission to be reflectors of his light into the world. Christmas has become a time when there are uh, presents, it's all focused on stories, it's focused on all sorts of things but we are to be reflectors of his light. And when Jesus says, you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill, 
I was listening to a message uh, just over the last week about the, the, the history of, of, of archaeology and how um, cities were discovered throughout Bible times. And a lot of these cities were, were built actually on a hill. The hill was called a tell, T-E-L or T-E-L-L. -L. And every time a city was destroyed through battle, it was important they had things like water, agriculture, all these things were an important part of it. So rather than just moving the city somewhere else, they would just level everything and build on top. And over the course of thousands of years, you might have city after city after city after city built, and they become cities on a hill. But the thing is, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Because within the city, you'd have, uh, within inside the walls, you'd have the rich people. They had all the money, they had the goods, they had everything there, they lived in the prime real estate. Then you had people who were middle class living on the walls. But outside the walls, you had the poor. And they would often look to the city as a place of hope, as a place of shelter, as a place of protection, as a place of provision, because the rich people would actually bring some of their excess to the city gates, which is where their welfare system operated from, and the poor would come to get their goods. The city gates were an important part of a city. The city was an important part of that whole region, because like I said, the poor look to the city as a place of hope. And when Jesus says, you are a city on a hill, the light of the world. You and I are supposed to be a place of hope for the lost. People who actually reflect Jesus to the world. And when Jesus says, you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill, he was saying that just like he was, we are now called to continue that mission to bring his light to the world. And when he said, go make disciples, he was commissioning us to his mission. Christmas is a time where we celebrate Jesus, but we receive our orders to go out again. And as believers, as children of God, our job is to take his light and reflect it to the world. So that when people look at you and they look at me, they should see Jesus. And I know there's times that's not the case. But what I love is the fact that every time we fail, we can come before God and say, Father, I'm sorry. I've sinned. I've messed up. I want to go again. And when we look at a candle, we have this candle here in front of me. When a candle is lit, you see the flame. And we acknowledge the flame and a, and a candle in a house that glows you can see it, it creates an element of light and as we focus on this candle it becomes particularly in a dark room it actually becomes the place of focus but if I take this candle I was given now I have two flames this one has been lit from the original. But this purpose of this flame, for the, for the purpose of what I'm saying, is to reflect the main candle. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Your job is to reflect the light. And if I come across to a table here and find a candle, And I want you to continue spreading this around the room. <laughs> and what I want you to notice is that as these candles spread around the room, we're going to start seeing light after light after light. And a couple of these front tables already have their candles lit. And if you can see them, and I want you to notice this as your candles start being lit, that the faces of those holding the candle start becoming visible. And in a dark room, you can look at me and you can see my face because of the light that shines. Our Christmas message is to leave here and be light bearers to the world. Jesus is 
the light of the world. And we're going to sing a few songs, some of them carols. But I want you, as your candle is lit, to keep an eye on your flame. What does the flame of God represent to you? How can you be a flame bearer to the world? And as we sing, let this be a time where you say, God, I want to recommit my life to you. I want to be a light bearer to the world. I want to reflect you to those around me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for everything you have done for us. That even when man sinned, you still had a plan to redeem us. That you didn't say, well, that's it, over and done with. You're done. You can just die off and start again. No, you had a plan for our salvation. And we are so blessed because of your incredible love for us. That your story of salvation was woven right through the Bible. That every book has a portrait of Christ, the theme of Christ, and talks over and over and over about your plan for us. And we thank you for sending your son. We thank you that we have a day we can celebrate the birth of your son, the saviour of the world. That as the angels said, fear not, I bring you good news. That the story of Christmas is a day we celebrate the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, as we leave here, let us continue to be light bearers. As we sing, we want to declare your goodness. And we want to thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.